First off, I'll start off with some thanks. I want to thank uh, Gene Marcus at, the, at UBC Sustainability here for really being instrumental in putting this specific event on. Um, all the, the background and stuff that's happening, Gene sort of made that happen, so uh, very grateful to that. Um, also, Future Energy Systems, which is at the University of Alberta, and it's uh, funded through the Canada First Research Excellence Fund, Excellence Fund and, and the two principal investigators, Imra Siemens over here and Mark Simpsons over there. They were instrumental in co-organizing this event, sort of behind the scenes. So um, that's all I'll call them out on for now. <laughs> and um, I also want to thank my home department here at UBC, the Department of Language and Literacy uh, Education, and it's in the Faculty of Education, and that's where I'm uh, housed as a faculty member. But uh, the biggest thanks and the biggest um, shout out here is to, to recognize the land that we're on, and that is to say that we are on the um, ancestral, uh, traditional, and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. And it's a privilege to be doing this kind of work and being on, on this land to talk about these issues. So the goal of this panel is uh, to promote sort of an open conversation uh, between the panel and the audience members here about energy transition and action and particularly how these socio-cultural elements of our energy futures might involve sort of broad notions of literacy in institutional or public contexts. So panel members will, will offer transdisciplinary perspectives from the areas of the, their respective areas of law, education, geography, environmental sciences, community organizing, and probably many more. And this isn't to say they're beholden to these uh, disciplines, but these are kind of where they, where they are housed in the moment. So each panel member will, uh, has really been tasked to very broadly answer this question of how do we develop social literacy and action about energy transition. And I'll, serve, I'll, I'll provide a little context here before I introduce the panel and we let them take it away. But um, so while only 35% of North Americans can uh, pass environmental literacy tests, about 10% can pass energy literacy tests. So energy assumes that uh, there's an understanding about how energy functions in the universe and in our lives. For example, an energy literate person um, could theoretically identify uh, various energy systems, where forms of energy come from, sort of impacts and consequences of energy and uses, and then where to locate credible uh, information and uh, credible information and data about energy. Now, all of these factors contribute toward people's ability to com communicate about energy uh, and energy use and doing all this in meaningful ways. So despite such low energy rates, energy literacy rates, a recent poll demonstrated that 77% of Canadians have either concern or extreme concern for the impact of energy on society and the environment. Now the, this restrictive literacy loop has created what we might call the current you know, climate energy impasse and that is to say if people don't understand the consequences of energy um, production and its use um, and their immediate links to climate change, then it's increasingly difficult for people to take part in imagining new ways of living without fossil fuels. Uh, changing our energy futures requires not only researching infrastructures and technologies, uh, but also transforming how we perceive the value um, energy, the value of energy systems in our multifaceted social and educational networks. So with, th with this in mind, um, it's important to consider how energy is not only geophysical or, uh, sorry, geo, yeah, geophysical and economic, but also social and cultural in the ways um, that it is conceptually and practically um, influencing our lives. So the overarching question for the panel is intended to be quite broad, very purposefully, allowing each panel member to draw on those various perspectives of their respective disciplines. But the main focus is really about sort of transition and action and how these, these elements uh, in society uh, might, in, uh, might involve notions of literacy in an institutional or a public context. So after each member panel provides their brief opening remarks, uh, the panel will take questions and comments from the audience. Um, for the remainder of the time. So the goal is to promote this, this sort of dialogue back and forth. So please keep your questions and your comments, write them down, be ready to, be ready to roll with those. Um, and one quick note about that, the, once the panel members are finished, is that this is being recorded um, and it will be posted on the UBC Sustainability website and other places. So um, if you ask a question, you make a comment, you will be recorded. So that's 
just to let you know that. And we, we also need you to, have, uh, to be speaking into a microphone so that we can get that um, on the recording. So we'll have two people floating around for that. So just put your hand up and kind of keep, keep uh, people going with microphones. Okay, so without further ado here, I think it's time to get to the panel. So I'll just introduce them in the, the order in which they're, they're seated here and which they're going to go. Um, on my left here is Jessie Beyer. Uh, she's a student, uh, sorry, a, a teacher, artist, and a PhD student at the University of Alberta. Her current research, and I particularly like this title, I have to say, Jessie, okay. um, is Teaching at the End of the World, Weird Pedagogy Plus Speculative Futurity examines how education systems produce resources for thinking the future in light of various impasses facing both students and teachers today, uh, with the aim of fabulating weird speculations on how pedagogical life might be thought otherwise. Next to Jessie here is Amanda Jiang, and she's a, an assistant professor in the Institute for Resources, Environment, and Sustainability, and in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at UBC. She's interested in understanding how environmental assessment processes can better empower communities and inform policy decision making and more broadly interactions between science, technology, and uh, public policy. Next to Amanda is Kevin McCart McCartney. He's a PhD student in the Department of Geography here at UBC and his, re his research seeks to engage energy workers and resource communities on issues of climate change, energy transition, justice, and dignity. His uh, work begins from the premise that we are all experts in our own lives. And then, not now, next to uh, Kevin, but Grace Nosick is here. The, due to a leg injury, the stool is not um, permi permissible at the moment, but, but she will be um, standing up when she gives her opening remarks. Um, so Grace is a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation scholar getting her PhD in the Peter A. Allard School of Law here at UBC. Grace has written and published three novels in a hopeful climate fantasy series, the Ava <laughs> of the Gaia Trilogy, and is a founding member of the UBC Climate Hub, which is, I think is in this building, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and then finally, we have at the end, Matt Hearn. And Matt lives on the tsleil Squamish, and Musqueam territory with his partner and daughters, and currently co-directs Solid State Industries. His most recent books are Global Warming and the Sweetness of Life, and that is with uh, Am Joal and Joe Sacco. And the next book is titled On This Patch of Grass, City Parks on Occupied Land, and that is um, co-authored with Daisy Couture, Sadie Couture, Selena Couture, Glenn Coulthard, and Denise Ferreira da Silva. So at this point, I will um, hand it over to Jesse. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek, and thank you also to the panelists. I'm excited to uh, learn with and from you today. I'm going to stand up because I tend to use my hand a lot. Oh, there. That's a good way to start. <laughs> I only have seven minutes and it's taken like 20 seconds. Okay. So, I don't know about all of y'all, but this question that we're kind of looking at today uh, is one among many that keeps me up at night. Even after seemingly productive days of reading and writing and thinking and talking about the need for a just energy transition, after classes and workshops and discussions with students, future teachers who are grappling with the slow cancellation of educational futures, which I might add are disappearing just as fast as those species disappearing from the planet on a daily basis, after heart-wrenching days of organizing with comrades against the fascism that rears its head in suits and ties and yellow vests, during these times of crises, climate and otherwise, and even after inspiring days of scheming with and learning from people like you in panels, uh, I nevertheless find myself lying awake in the still of night, struck with pangs of despair as my tummy aches and thoughts of the coming, no current annihilations dance in my head. Is this social literacy? <laughs> if it is, it is no wonder that social illiteracy rates are seemingly on the rise. Let's be honest, things are not looking good right now. Heat deaths, the end of food, climate plagues, unbreathable air, species extinction, perpetual war, but weaponized bullshit, permanent economic collapse, poisoned oceans, and a general inability to imagine, let alone address, these impending catastrophes are just some, just a sprinkling of the pressing issues facing us today. And while we're being honest, I have to add that in my own experience of these issues is hardly worth complaining about. 
buffered by time and space and money, I have it pretty good. After all, while such questions keep me up at night, I'm able to keep cozy in my fossil fuel heated home and distracted by any number of different electrical devices that are powered by coal and natural gas. But getting stuck here in the muck of guilt, caught by despair and charges of hypocriticism, serves no one. Or worse, can result in, as Jody Dean writes, just another form of liberal jouissance, a vehicle for enjoying destruction, self-punishment, and ultimately, knowing. So, uh, wide awake and under the cover of night, my thoughts eventually shift away from asking how to make things better towards asking how do we make things less worse. Can literacy, social or otherwise, play a role here? And what are we missing? Is it information or access to information or more diverse or perhaps uh, slicker representations, better graphs, more stats, maybe some step-by-step, -step, something to break down the key information? How about some art uh, that can tell us something about energy transition? That might do it. Or maybe we need to develop tools and processes capable of conscientization of providing more in-depth and nuanced understandings of the world and by extension the word in order to expose the oppressions, injustices and contradictions we all live with and through today. Indeed, as a good pedagogical professional, I should probably turn to Paolo Freire, that canonical pedagogue of the oppressed, and align social literacy with his conceptualization of emancipatory literacy. Perhaps I should advocate for a social literacy that is able to read the world as a necessary precedent for reading the word, which in turn can transform it by means of conscious practical work. From this point of view, the question of developing social literacy becomes linked to one's ability to read, to decipher, decode, interpret, and correlate both the world or one's experience every day and the word, which in this case, uh, in the case of energy transition, might be forwarded by policymakers or people in the energy humanities. Easy peasy, right? Uh, my wide awake and sometimes trembling midnight self is not so sure. That is the claim that we or they need better readings or the tools to do so assumes that the apparent lack of action or en on energy transition can be attributed to merely representational challenges. Lack of or too much information, bad or confusing representations, or maybe just not enough art. Wink, that's a wink. I'm an art, yeah. No. Uh, this claim becomes suspect when we acknowledge, as many have, that we already have all the information we need. The detrimental impacts of global warming, for instance, are not a new discovery, having been understood as early as 1979, when the world's major powers came within several signatures of endorsing a binding global framework to reduce emissions, carbon emissions. And in more recent news, young activists such as Greta Thunberg have offered such, uh, some sobering contentions about this apparent lack of information, asserting to UN leaders, for instance, quote, some people say that I should study to become a climate scientist so that I can solve the climate crisis. But the climate crisis has already been solved. We already have all the facts and solutions, end quote. Even in our everyday readings of the world, we are provided with more and more first-hand information, empirical evidence, volatile weather patterns, apocalyptic skies, unfarmable soils, that seemingly have the potential to spur the masses to action. And yet, here we are. And so as I lie awake late at night in a dreamless state, I can't help but think, as Andrew Colt puts it, how to keep the dream of revolution alive in counter-revolutionary times. When it comes to issues like social literacy and action on energy transition, I turn to this stateless dream work and ask not how to get more information to the masses or how to represent the situation better, but instead how we, <clears throat> how we might learn to care differently. Or how we might make it so that it is no longer possible to not care. If we read these questions stereoscopically on top of each other, social literacy takes on a different character. That is, in addition to notions of reading and conscientization, which are important, social literacy becomes redirected towards and entangled with questions of materiality, those infrastructural and systemic conditions that pre-position, predispose, and preoccupy us so as not to care, questions of possibility, that horizon of the thinkable that comes to occupy the dreaming life of the population through there is no alternative rhetorical maneuvers, and questions of belief, where belief does not denote religious or political or other ideological positions, but rather, as Lazzarato develops, belief as a disposition to act, 
belief in an invisible world, one that is to come, one that is affirmed, or sorry, that in turn affirms it as real, putting to test the ability for a subject to act on such a possible belief in the first place. So to conclude, I hope to draw on these entanglements in order to offer a few dreamy what ifs around social literacy. What if social literacy was not only about developing the skills to read the word or the world, but about joining together in yet unthought collective formations so as to question and potentially dismantle those material conditions that have come to limit our ability to care and thus to act? What if social literacy was not just about advocating for further or better representations, identifications, and communications, but instead attuned to those non-representational powers, effective capacities, desiring flows that give us goosebumps and tummy aches and keep us up at night? And perhaps more importantly, what if social literacy provided the skills for us to say no to those who tell us, sorry, tell, <laughs> Social literacy provided us the skills to say no to those who tell us to take the world as it is. To develop a praxis of negation that does not merely aim to naysay or contradict, but instead to refuse the options presented in order to open up yet unthought energy imaginaries. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm just going to preface my remarks with a little bit of context, which is that the reason I was invited on this panel is because Derek and I are both uh, a part of a group of sustainability scholars on campus working with the UBC Sustainability Initiative, and we're developing sustainability-related curriculum. Uh, and the course that I'm working on, I'm co-teaching with my colleague Terry Satterfield, is called Energy, Environment, and Society, uh, and it's for engineers and scientists. And so um, when I was thinking about this question about you know, what does energy literacy mean? I was really thinking about it in the context of what's been happening in my classroom over the past few weeks. Uh, and so at the beginning of the term, we did this brief anonymous survey just to get a sense of who was in the room. And, and two of the questions we asked were, first of all, which aspects of energy systems do you feel the most comfortable with? And then also, do you feel the least comfortable with? And so um, what we found was that in general, the you know, learners in our room were actually pretty uh, they knew a lot already about energy systems, particularly about energy technologies, sources of energy, forms of energy, conversions. Um, but what they felt more uncomfortable with was, next slide, um, the social and, okay, you don't need to see it, but you know, the social and political uh, dimensions of energy systems. And, uh, what was also interesting to us was that when we asked them which aspects of energy systems they were most interested in learning more about, uh, despite the fact that a lot of them identified that these social dimensions were some of the ones that they knew the least about, they weren't necessarily the most interested in learning about those. So, I mean, I think we could, you know, one easy way we could interpret this would be that, okay, these are scientists and engineers, they don't really value the social aspects. but. You know, after spending a few weeks in class with these students, I really think the story is a lot more nuanced than that. And uh, I don't think it's that they don't value the social dimensions, because I think they absolutely do. Um, it's also, it's just that I think they, they think it's really hard. <laughs> like, it's really messy, and there are disagreements and fights, uh, and that feels uncomfortable. And honestly, I get it. I, I was also trained as an engineer and scientist, and I totally understand the very seductive appeal of techno-optimism, right? The idea that maybe if we focus on the technologies, it's gonna obviate the need for this discomfort because then we won't need to make these trade-offs and there won't be you know, winners and losers. So uh, in the context of this class, something that we're hoping, we're hoping to help these students kind of confront or, or think about um, these linkages between technology and politics uh, which I think for all these energy humanists in the room, certainly does, that doesn't sound like anything provocative here, but I think for a lot of stu art students in engineering and science, it, it does feel that way, is that we're using some case studies. Uh, and two, two that I want to highlight are solar parks in India and offshore wind in northern BC. So both of these have to do with scaling up renewables. And I think the reason why these case studies, we're finding them so useful for helping the students uh, you know, to like think through and, and think with some of these issues is, uh, I think a lot of folks, you know, hope, they just think, you know, if we have renewables scaled up, then maybe we can avoid all of these fights about pipelines and, and fights about territory. Uh, but I think that, you know, we find through examples like this that renewable energy technologies, 
don't suddenly do away with existing power structures. They don't do away with questions of territory and displacement, um, with social and ethical questions. And so in these two cases, we're talking about um, you know, if you want to produce renewable energy at scale, whether it's solar or wind, uh, it takes a lot of land. Um, and it's not just any land, it's specific kinds of land where there's good solar resource or good wind resource. Uh, but those specific places might also have social, political, legal specificities. <laughs> and so how do we confront that uh, overlap? And so I think, you know, when we think about these issues, really it forces us to still grapple with these social and ethical questions. I think it really highlights the fact that um, it's not like there's some technological solution that's all of a sudden gonna deal away with our social and ethical uh, quandaries, that, that discomfort. And so this is all a, a long way to get <laughs> at my tentative answer, I think, to um, you know, thinking about energy literacy in the context of what I've been seeing in my classroom. And I think a really key aspect of this is actually an affective one, an affective kind of liter literacy, the ability to really sit in this ambiguity, um, accept the messiness and the need for deliberation. And accepting that technical analysis or new technologies are very seldom the end of discussion. You know, much more often they're the, uh, the beginning uh, of a long, messy, deliberative process. Um, and that's not to say that I don't think technical analysis is important, because I mean, that's, that's what I spend my day doing. I do think it's important, but I think it's only one part of it. And so I think also having our students reach that conclusion and realize that's, that that's not a failure, that that messiness is not um, something to avoid necessarily, but is, is just a reality of our collective life. So um, there's a quote, I, I, found really generative in, in my thinking about this in terms of you know, thinking about technologies. And I'm just going to read it from there because it's easier for me to see <laughs> looking down. Um, Today, there's a need for technologies of humility to make apparent the possibility of unforeseen consequences, to make explicit the normative judgments that lurk within technical calculations, and to acknowledge the need for plural viewpoints and collective learning. So I, I, I think being able to accept technologies of humility and the limits of other kinds of technologies uh, is, I, I think, an important part of that um, affective literacy. So uh, just to wrap up, I do want to uh, thank my other colleagues at the USI because a lot of these thoughts came out of our last discussion, uh, which was really helpful for me. And then also th our students in this class who have been so generous and courageous with sharing their learning journey about energy systems with us. Uh, so I, yeah, I want to you know, thank them for helping me think about these issues as well. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Those are both terrific. Uh, still a tough act to follow. <laughs> and with a microphone, new to me. Um, with my brief time today, I, I really wanted to offer a provocation, but uh, as we sort of listen to these talks, I realize I'm really more in alignment uh, than I may be expected. So, uh, I'm really going to offer an allegory that I think uh, is really trying to strip away the existential urgency, uh, some of the discursive politics of energy transition, to help us think through change more effectively. <clears throat> In 1918, uh, the world's first manually operated three-color traffic light was used, uh, excuse me, using red, yellow, and green, was installed in New York City on Fifth Avenue. In 1920, Detroit became the first city in the world to develop a four-way stop based on that traffic light. And by the late 1920s, many major cities had electrified traffic lights with that same red, yellow, and green. Here in Vancouver, the first automated three-color traffic light appeared in 1928 at Maine and Hastings. And for the first few days, it caused a lot of chaos as people just stormed into the intersection to look at the light. Uh, but shortly, the city revealed that this had actually improved road safety. Uh, and of course, we followed with many other such lights around the city. <clears throat> the date of this technology is important because it means that every living generation has spent all of their driving years seeing the simple, clear design of the traffic light. And in Vancouver and in many other places, uh, the yellow light has always meant the same thing. You must stop unless it is unsafe to do so. But more than simply familiarity, Vancouver has a well-funded and well-organized system for ensuring intersection safety. In the early 1990s, more than two decades ago, we invented the countdown timers so drivers could have full information uh, to anticipate the end of a green light. 
The province of British Columbia, of course, uh, holds authority over who is allowed to drive, and while ever changing, this licensing system has long required at least one written and one practical exam to prove you're a safe and competent driver, including that you understand the yellow light. In addition to a regulatory system for ensuring drivers understand the yellow light, there's a broad enforcement system that includes intersection cameras, police officers, even transit police can, uh, can pull you over for, for a yellow light infraction. The penalty for not stopping at a yellow light is not only the potential of, a, of an embarrassing uh, and costly traffic ticket, um, it's also a uh, shame. Primarily through public education campaigns, our society actively shames unsafe drivers such that causing a, a traffic accident has normative and moral connotations. And of course, there are physical uh, harms, uh, potentially, for, for not stopping at a yellow light. Driving a literal ton of, high, of metal at high speeds makes each of us vulnerable to maiming uh, and even to death, and potentially threatens the same to others. In short, the consequences for ignoring yellow light are potentially severe, irreversible, and immediate to both ourselves as drivers and people in our, in our immediate community. The consequences, of course, for stopping the yellow light are waiting uh, a minimum of 12 seconds and a maximum of 180 seconds in stillness. Vancouver has a system of yellow light literacy that is as old as driving itself, is unchanged, is required by law, is tested by the state, is enforced by financial penalty, public norms, and the threat of physical harm. In short, from the perspective of programming and policy, policy Vancouver has perfect yellow light literacy. <laughs> to mirror the phrasing uh, earlier, and yet, <laughs> Uh, no one stops at yellow lights. Uh, we can see uh, Vancouver, Vancouverites speeding up as the countdown timer gets to zero. They go through stale yellows when there are people waiting to turn left. They simply refuse to, s to gently press on the other pedal in the face of imminent physical danger. We could easily take from this very prosaic example that I am experiencing road rage <laughs> here in this room. And we <laughs> I, honestly, we might not be wrong. Um, but we could also make another other, a number of other assumptions. Some might believe that this disjuncture between yellow light literacy and yellow light action is human nature, right? We're short-term thinkers. Others might say it's uh, modern people, right? That we're so convenience obsessed that we would trade the threat of physical harm for 12 seconds of open roads. Insurance adjusters, sociologists uh, could generate fascinating data on the generational, gendered, class, racialized uh, distributions of driving behaviors. And still others, of course, would charge that we actually don't know the yellow light literacy. We have to retest drivers. And maybe if we find they are literate, we need more accountability through more cameras and, and uh, sensors in cars. I offer this sort of mundane uh, example of road safety because I think it demonstrates to me two, uh, two very important things about the less mundane task of saving our species. The first is that no amount of expert design, state enforcement, public education campaigns, and uncertain personal threat ever gets us to change our behavior in a sustained way. We can't trick, we can't cajole, manage people into a particular vision of a sustainable world. Not only do those efforts at management immediately confront injustice, injustices we might call uh, whose vision and who benefits, but they remind us of dealing with our boss. And that makes people passive aggressive, resentful, and even angry. If we want change, that change has to start uh, at the everyday level with what works for people. The second thing I try to remember about yellow light literacy is that the statistically average Canadian is only in their car to drive between a job they don't like and a home they can't afford. <laughs> Often the continuity we're protecting uh, by trying to make social change individual and accessible is precisely the context that makes it impossible, undesirable, or simply low priority for people to participate. That 12 seconds in traffic and the, all of the effort we ask from people to be more environmentally conscious and engaged comes out of our fleeting and overburdened personal time. To achieve the large scale of change that our planet requires, environmental action has to start coming out of the company's time. That means taxing the rich and not molecules to invest in energy infrastructures. It means 20-hour work weeks for radical degrowth. It means climate reparations from companies that have actively pursued denial and obstruction. And it means an environmental movement that's based on personal, community, and cultural dignity. Thank you. You can just start on the second slide, Derek. Okay. Hi, still a tough <laughs> act to follow. <laughs> uh, did anyone see this story about the man who saved someone with CPR that he learned on The Office? Does anyone? Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's where I'm starting. Um, I found that story so fascinating. So 
Last week, uh, a man saved a woman who was kind of in this incredibly dangerous situation. Uh, he had never learned CPR, but he'd seen it on the office, uh, essentially that you have to kind of do the rhythm to, uh, I think, staying alive maybe is fast enough. Uh, and that just really sparked, that's kind of what we've been doing at UBC in this group that I've been working with, is meeting people where they are on climate and welcoming them in. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of, we've had a lot of failure, but we've had a lot of successes. So I'm going to chat a bit about those and then also kind of coming off some of what the other speakers have said, why I think new narratives are so important because a group of very powerful people have been actively undermining narratives for a long time. And what I study is how corporations manufacture doubt around climate science. So, but I'm going to start with some of what we've tried uh, to meet people where they are. Because uh, our sense is that people are saturated in this day and age. There's so much to take in, so much to care about. Uh, and so how, how do we be the office giving them climate justice in their everyday? Um, so, next slide, Derek. So um, a few of the things that we've really been thinking about for meeting people where they are on climate and climate justice is the idea of vouchers, um, and then uh, which we've really taken up here at the UBC Climate Hub. And then I uh, have tried two different things, uh, including these young adult climate fantasy novels and a podcast. And those kind of arise from the fact that I've been doing work and studying climate for a decade. Um, but when I would publish academic articles, I knew about two or three hundred people would read them, and I knew that was never going to be enough. So how to think about different ways of telling stories. So vouchers, if you haven't heard of them, they're kind of the, the new thing in, in climate social science, are a very simple idea, but it's just a sense that trusted community members um, can tell a community how their va values align with climate action. And the more local and kind of tied to that community, the better. But I'm from the US. Uh, one way we're seeing that is some kind of like the elder statesman Republicans saying how that view of the world um, could actually fit with climate justice. Um, but there's lots of different communities uh, from every scale. And in theory, we are all vouchers to a community. And so we're trying to think about how we could make every student at UBC kind of a climate ambassador. Uh, and a climate voucher. Uh, especially, there's 60,000 students here. We come from everywhere around the world. Um, and if you could empower folks to talk about climate justice well and to be able to go back to their community and do that, what that might look like. Uh, so one of the ways, next slide, Derek. Um, oh, yes, yeah, so that's just vouchers. Uh, and, and the key thing is that um, science, scientific literacy, does not at all affect how you feel about climate change. You can give more people more scientific information, but they've actually shown, Dan Kahan at Yale, that people with higher scientific literacy are actually better at rationalizing why they don't believe in the climate science. That, that worldview is so foundational to how folks feel about climate action. Um, and so really thinking about uh, what that means in different communities. So uh, the Climate Hub, which is this group that we've started at UBC, uh, has started a climate mentorship program. And we've grouped 160 folks into pods uh, that have different climate themes. So art and climate change, or biodiversity and climate change, or uh, corporate accountability. And trying to think about how uh, coming at climate through a lens that you already care about and already uh, want to learn about might really empower you um, to, to be able to talk about or care about this uh, to other communities. And so uh, these pods meet every two weeks because the other sense is that you really need this community, this like tangible community that you can process these ideas and, and come up with projects. Um, and just, uh, yeah, just it's a, it's a continual uh, conversation. Uh, so we've found that to be really powerful and thinking about how you might create communities all over. So one of the next things we're interested in is working with um, <coughs> athletic groups and sororities and fraternities, uh, places where there are already kind of these dense, densely networked social groups where there are clear leaders. And if you could empower them to talk to their own community about climate and climate justice, how powerful that would be. Um, and also then creating community because so many people feel 
feel alone and want connection and want meaning in life. So if you're also giving them kind of community while they're doing that, it's so generative to kind of be involved in the movement. So uh, something else that I've tried, and this, so when I was in law school, <coughs> I was studying all of these things, again, uh, learning about them, and just immediately felt like I wanted to, to be getting the narrative out to a broader, broader group. So I found the one professor at Harvard Law School who was like, yes, you can write young adult romance <laughs> novels <laughs> for credit. <laughs> and that's what I did. I, I wove in all of these themes that I was uh, learning about and caring about, climate justice, um, gender issues, <coughs> class, race, and wove them into the novels and actually learned the most about those issues trying to figure out how to communicate them. And so I think that's such an interesting thing. So many people have a skill set that they either want to practice more or they want to use more. Um, and if we could empower them to be climate ambassadors through these stories, it would be so powerful. Um, but yeah, I've had people of all ages read these and get back to me, and I just heard that a four-year-old was reading them and kind of loving them, um, and just this sense that uh, you could read this because it's a young adult romance novel, and plenty of people just want kind of escapist fantasy. But underneath all of that, um, there are these stories that you could pull out, and, and they're, um, mine are particularly like kind of hopeful and joyful, because uh, that's another thing from the social science that uh, it's important that people uh, understand the scope of the problem, but that they have to feel agency and they have to feel empowered or they, they won't come into it. And so thinking about like creating these, these joyful, hopeful narratives. Uh, and then the final kind of experiment I've had with reaching people where they are. Um, oh, and so I've spoken to more than uh, 2,000 students about the books. And so just, again, just how generative these new stories can be because then you can, you can go into a space and you can tell that story to a new audience who might just not want to hear about my corporate accountability research, but I can kind of inform that when I come and I talk about climate fantasy. Uh, and then the final thing that I've tried, uh, again, based off the research and, and my own life, is that I, I don't consume climate media in almost any form. Like, everyone's always like, there's this new movie you have to see, Grace, and I'm like, I never want to see anything about climate like when I'm not working on it because it's so heavy and paralyzing and it actually takes me away from my work because I feel so overwhelmed and sad and I'm kind of, I always think if I am not watching these movies or listening to these podcasts that's a problem because I've, my entire life is like dedicated to this issue and so I've been really thinking about how to create something that people could come to for a different reason and so I started this podcast that just stare, shares the human stories of climate change, of the, of the people who are working on climate and the friendships that they've made and um, the lovely experiences that they've had because doing climate work has been the most joyful part of my life. I never thought that would be the case, but it has given me the most amazing friendships um, and the most wonderful meaning. And so documenting that and, and a different reason to come into the movement has been really powerful and exciting. And then just the final piece, because uh, I can never present without mentioning it, is that we're not starting from a blank slate on energy literacy. Um, starting in 1989, uh, the year, right after the International Panel on Climate Change, Intergovernment, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was formed, um, a very powerful counter movement, which scholars have turned the climate, cha climate change counter movement um, coalesced and for uh, decades they have been spending hundreds of millions of dollars to sow doubt around climate science. Um, and so one example, Naomi Oreskes and Jeffrey Supran, two scholars at Harvard, um, did a study of the internal versus the public documents of ExxonMobil for the last three decades, um, and they concluded that Exxon did mislead the public. Uh, they didn't comment on the legality of that because many people are suing ExxonMobil right now. Um, but they had examples like this. This is an uh, Exxon internal document saying that there will be potentially ca catastrophic events. Uh, for example, if the Antarctic ice sheet, which is anchored on land, should melt, then this could cause a rise in sea level on the order of five meters. So that's 1982, Derek, if you don't mind. Uh, in 2000, this is a public editorial 
just as changeable as your local weather forecast, views on the climate change debate range from seeing the issue as serious or trivial and from seeing the possible fu future impacts as harmful or beneficial. Uh, another scholar said that these groups had annual funding of $900 million. Um, they weren't, sing they're not, most of them are not single issue groups, so that didn't all go to uh, climate, but that's kind of the scale at play for creating these narratives. Um, and just the final point that I think is so important is that um, Super and Anarescu's found that they weren't just undermining the science, they've been actively undermining the public's ability to feel like they can solve climate change for decades. So if you hear people be disempowered or wonder if this is possible, which I hear all the time, that's been an actively constructed narrative. And I think that is so perverse that we don't have, we don't feel like we have agency to deal with this issue. I got, I got a few thanks here, but uh, my, first, uh, my first thanks and gratitude is to, is to acknowledge that we're on the unceded and ancestral lands of the Musqueam here, and so to uh, thank them for the generosity of hosting us here. Um, and I'll see if I can return to that real briefly. Um, but I should say also thanks to, thanks to Imran, to Derek, and Mike for inviting uh, me. Um, and, and more than that, even than that for you three, and I appreciate your efforts in putting it together and bringing me up here. I, it, I don't come to universities all that often. Um, and uh, it just struck me as I was listening to all you four talk. Um, Sir, your mic's on, I'm sitting on it. I, I'm not sure it's either off or maybe the battery's dead. Thank you. Is it okay if I just keep talking? Uh, no. Just for the recording. No, maybe. don't, don't <laughs> keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Young. Yeah. While we're here, just don't forget there's uh, tea and coffee back there. <laughs> <laughs> so please, you know, you can. Uh, oh, okay, we are here late. Sugar high. You just walk around with batteries in your pocket, then? Pretty much, yeah. Super MacGyver. Thank you. How's that? Oh, that's better. Um, Sam, that I. Uh, as I was just sitting here thinking, I was thinking, honestly, I was. It was pouring rain when I was coming up here, and I was kind of regretting it. <laughs> I was sort of thinking on the way up. I was like, oh, is there a... I was sitting on the bus, and I was, somebody sounded like they had TB beside me, and I was like, I don't know. Is there a guy call in? Can I call him and say I'm not coming? Or like, I'm tired. I was like, no, nah, come on, man. For God's sake, just, just show up. And as I was sitting here through, uh, listening to all four of you guys, um, I was super grateful. I was like, that was really good. That was super good. That was super smart and to each of you, so thanks a lot. Um, that was great. Um, um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tiny bit flummoxed because honestly, you guys said a bunch of things I was, going, I was thinking about saying. So let me see if I can just tell a real quick story on this. Um, and I, I think maybe the story is, is a, it's a question that's, that's been banging around my head like it has yours for a long time in all kinds of ways. Um, but it's actually a, quite a personal story in a lot of ways. Um, and it, it, it came to, to my mind with some clarity this fall when, you know, the IPCC re produced its, its one of its uh, regular uh, terrifying reports. Um, uh, and and there was, it seemed to be even more unequivocal and more uh, straightforward than, than, than typical. You know, I'm sure you remember this from November of 2018, and it said something like, Basically, you got 12 years. Um, and they said it in better language, but it was, you know, you're fucked. <laughs> um, you got 12 years, and I, I can't remember, I, I, I've written it down, but it's like uh, massive, long-lasting, fundamental changes in every aspect of human existence before catastrophic changes are going to begin to occur with rapidly accelerating velocity that are going to change everything you know about human existence on the planet. Something like that, you know? Um, and I remember reading it, and you know, I, I like you, I, uh, I pay attention to this stuff. I mean, mostly sort of, sort of through prurient, you know, kind of titillation or whatever. Um, but I, you know, I paid attention to it, and it, and it just struck me 
this fall and with uh, a particular kind of acuity that um, I, I was just so confused uh, and, and curious um, about my own reaction because my own reaction, frankly, was, uh, was more or less ambivalent. Um, and I read about this stuff. I think about this stuff. I've, I've, I write about it. I, I, I wander around talking about it. Um, and yet my reaction to it was, was confusing to me in lots of ways and continues to confuse me. Um, in that if, if somebody came to me and, uh, you know, touch wood, but it may well happen, uh, and said, listen, bubs, you got 12 years um, to change your behavior, otherwise there, you're going to have physically bodily implications. You know, we've, you know, maybe it might be my doctor, uh, and my, maybe my doctor looks at me and says, you know, man, like things are going south here. You got 12 years, otherwise you're just going to like, it's going to get really bad for you. The honest truth is, is that I would change my behavior that afternoon. Um, and my doctor, she could tell me, change what I eat, change what I eat, change how I exercise, change where I live, and honestly, I'd be open to, to that like, absolutely, you know? You tell me I gotta start eating vegetarian, you gotta start telling me I gotta go all meat, you tell me, like, whatever you gotta tell me, I'll do it. Like, if, and, and, I, and I feel very confident that I'd be able to respond to that. And yet, the honest, cold truth is, is that even though I intellectually know, um, and I 100% believe, like I believe most everybody does, that those IPCC reports are um, true, um, and yet, the honest truth is, I don't do shit to change. Um, I do performative white guy stuff. I uh, took the bus up here, and I want to tell you about it. Um, I, you know, I ride my, you know, I ride my bike and whatever. But the honest truth is, is that I fly back and forth across the damn world talking about global warming. My, um, my, and I fly for other reasons as well. Um, and my, I, I don't even want to think or calculate my like carbon load or my my footprint or whatever because it's going to be gross, um, and it's going to be embarrassing. Um, and so it's really curious to me. It's like, is why, why don't I, why, frankly, why don't I change? Why, what, what, what would I do? And, and part of those are, those are two questions that are bound up. Part of it is that a certain kind of inertia and a certain kind of overcomfort and a certain kind of uh, resistance to change um, the way old white guys are. Um, but also is that I'm not exactly c clear what I would do. Like, I know I should stop flying so much. I, I know that for sure. But what else? Is there anything else I could do, like recycle more? Like, what, what am I supposed to be doing here? Um, and, and some of my kind of weird, unsettling um, uh, discomfort is mitigated, I guess, by the fact that, honestly, I don't really know anybody else that does shit. Um, I know some people that do some things and some people that are performative, kind of like, you know, primitivist types or whatever, and they will blog about it like, happily um, about their activity. But honestly, I don't really know anybody that fundamentally changes their behavior, and certainly not on the kind of scale with the depth and fundamental urgency that the IPCC suggests. But more troubling than that, I don't actually know of any single jurisdiction of any size anywhere in the world that is undertaking the kind of changes that we intellectually know are necessary. I know there are certainly some places that are doing some things around solar and wind power, I know there are some places that are doing some stuff around uh, sustainable agriculture. I know there are some places that are doing some stuff around carbon taxes. There are certain jurisdictions that are doing better than, uh, say, British Columbia. I know that, but I don't know of any single place, big or small, any jurisdiction that is doing anything like the kinds of wide-scale, fundamental social, economic, and cultural changes that are required. Now, I know that there's also these kind of dislocations that are involved here, right? There's a temporal dislocation, that for years and years and years, we're asking uh, us to care about something that is in some kind of indefined uh, future. 12 years is something that I can kind of relate to. It's still 12 years down the road, so it's still kind of too far, honestly, for me to care that much, um, uh, realistically speaking. Um, but there's also a spatial dislocation, right? Which is to say that, yeah, I, I know that I'm going to feel it somehow here. I like that, but, but not really. The most, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm, don't have any familiarity with the Maldives or, um, you know, maybe the, you know, maybe the, the subway systems that'll, maybe New York subway systems will be affected in some kind of way. But there's, there's, there's also a spatial dislocation. I, I don't perceive that it's going to affect my bodily uh, future uh, anytime soon. That those things are going to happen somewhere further away from me and in some time distance away. So I've been thinking about those things for a long time, like, like all of us have, um, in various ways and with various kinds of sincerity. Um, but in 2014, uh, my story and my particular kind of engagement with this story picks up some, um, because uh, uh, one of my daughters went to work in the tar sands. Um, 
and so questions of, of accountability and questions of agency and questions of responsibility uh, gain some kind of added poignancy. Um, my kid was in her mid-20s, kind of scuffling, working in um, uh, cafes and bars and making fine money, but not particularly getting to places where she wanted to go in her life. Um, and she needed a change. Um, and so she took a job out in a patch. Um, and she didn't tell me until about two weeks before she left, um, which was curious, um, but totally not surprising at all, right? I, I, and she, the, the answer to why she didn't tell me is because she was embarrassed and was afraid I was going to freak out or whatever. And, um, uh, and I sort of did, but I tried not to show it. Um, I was like, you know, like immediately as parents do, you immediately go like internalize it into some kind of failings of your own or whatever, right? I didn't give her money. I'm too broke. Like, what? What's going on? What have I done wrong? Um, um, uh, but of course, I you know love and support her, and I totally understand. And, and the job was dope. Um, she uh, she was she actually didn't work in the patch patch. She worked in a in a um, uh, in a camp just north of town, up in a uh, actually within driving distance of town, but up just north of the loop. For those of you who know Fort Mac, um, and uh, uh, basically it was a, a camp uh, where guys came and most guys came and went. And she it was seventy hours a week. Um, so it was two full-time jobs. For the first 35 hours a week, she made $25 an hour. And for the second 35 hours a week, she made $37.5 an hour. Um, she was making mad money. She was out in, a, you know, out in a bush, so she didn't have to pay anything. Um, and basically, she had nothing to do. Like, somebody would show up. She'd hand them the room key, say it's number 275. It's down the hall. Cafeteria's that way. Ping pong room's that way. It's a dry camp. See you later. Um, and like, literally 95% of the time, she was doing nothing. And when she was doing something, it wasn't really that much anyways. Um, so she had a lot of time to think, um, and a lot of time to sit and think there. Um, and one of the things she did was write me. Um, and so we talked a lot. And one of the things she did was spend a lot of time on Facebook. Uh, and one of the times she did, one of the things she did was think a lot about her future and what she was, what she was going to do with it. And in a lot of ways, it was a tremendous experience. And she, um, she took that money and ended up going to um, go to nursing school, um, which is great. She's just finished now. Um, so in a lot of ways, that, that story is a, is, a, is a great story. And it's a story that you hear over and over again. Because when she was up there, it gave me an opportunity right away to try to go visit Fort Mac. Because I'd always wanted to go there. I'd always wanted to be in Fort Mac, or so close to what most people describe as the single biggest industrial project in human history, and the, perhaps the single biggest driver of, uh, of climate change, maybe the, the world's single largest identifiable climate villain. I always wanted to go and check it out. But I never felt any, like, I, I never felt, I didn't have a reason to get there. So my my kid went went work there. Um, it, it gave me a chance to go visit, um, but it wasn't also just her. It was it was her and a and a, and a whole group of her buddies. Um, and so I went in 2015, and then Am and Joe and I went again in uh, later 2015. And then basically I've been going back to Fort Mac uh, two, three, four times a year ever since. Um, and 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 it's really curious because um, for those of you that haven't spent time on Fort Mac. Um, it's a very difficult place to get into. It's a very pl difficult place to try to, to, to visit because nobody goes there to visit. There's, no, nobody, there's not a single person who goes there for a vacation. Nobody goes there for any other reason than, other than making money. So if you're there and not obviously ready to go make some money, you are, uh, people are suspicious of you. Um, and rightly so. <laughs> rightly so. Because, um, because the, the reaction I got from down here when I was, when we, when Am and and I and, and Joe and I started talking about going up there was basically the same and universalized opprobrium. Basically, what the fuck are you doing? Why would you go there? It's a nightmare. It's mortar. Why would you go up there? It's a bunch of monster truck driving mouth breathers. Um, there's a people up there who are willfully destroying the planet for one more lap dance. Uh, what are you looking for? Cheap coke? What, like, why would you go up there? You're like, you're. Why would you go up there and even try to, in any way, try to pay any respect to a place that is? in many minds from people, or at least people I know down here, willfully destroying the planet for a good paycheck. And, and those are the kind of things that I might well have said myself in some kind of either direct or indirect way. But, the, um, but those, those particular kinds of vectors change with some uh, rather dramatically when it's your kid you're talking about. Um, when it's, the, when it's, it's not that, you know, that it's about a, you know, a bunch of idiots up there who are just, you know, uh, you know, willful climate deniers just because they need a good paycheck. You're like, actually, hang on for a second. I was talking about what my kids are talking about. Um, and it's just not my kid either. It's, it was a bunch of her friends. Um, and so that's where we stayed when we hung out with. We went and stayed and, and, and spent a lot of time drinking in a variety of bars, uh, sleeping on a variety of basements, uh, eating at a variety of crappy fast food places, but really hanging out with my kid and her friends. 
And what we found over and over and over again was um, a bunch of young people who were, um, to various degrees, uh, super happy. Super happy up there in all kinds of ways. And I, I've, come to, uh, I've come to both appreciate and to, frankly speaking, actually really love being in Fort Mac. Um, not just because it actually, the experience of being in Fort Mac did something uh, good for my kid, um, but it, because it, it, it's, it did some really important things for a lot of her friends and friends who I'd known um, for most of their life and who kids who I've known since they were little. Um, almost all black and brown girls um, who have found partners, who have found lives, who have found jobs, who have found <coughs> career trajectories that they never would have otherwise here. Um, Fort Mac is an, a spectacularly diverse place. There's over 100 different uh, ethnic communities. And what I found uh, over and over and over again um, were people who, uh, as soon as they found out that I was not going to heap scorn, sarcasm, uh, and hipster opprobrium on them, um, were totally happy <coughs> to talk to me, were sophisticated, were thoughtful, had really compelling arguments in all kinds of ways. Not that people agreed with me in all kinds of ways. Um, in fact, I got into all kinds of fulsome debates in all kinds of bars. Um, but that their, their comments oftentimes were questions that, that, in fact, I couldn't answer myself. As a kid who I've known, you know, and that, that can maybe be summed up in some ways by a kid that I've known for forever since she was little, um, a young woman named Gita, and she just looked at me and she said, so if I didn't work here, what the hell would that do for anything? What would change then? Um, and it echoed exactly a, a friend of mine who is a professor and spends his entire life talking about climate science. And he says, well, you know what? Those planes are going to fly whether I'm on them or not. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I don't have an answer to either of those comments. Um, but what I do know and what I have come to believe is that questions around transition, questions around thinking about global warming, about renewables, uh, cannot be based in shame. They can't be based in denunciation. And what more than anything, I think, and I'm going to speak about a broader left, I think that the failure of environmentalism, uh, uh, an ongoing failure of ecology, and an ongoing failure of the left in general in contemporary climate discourses is a failure to be able to articulate a constructive and affirmative social vision. And as such then, uh, what I came to conclude was that, in fact, that we need to have a conversation about something much more fundamental than just talking about transition or about renewables. We need to actually be talking about ecology um, and, and having a fulsome and, and full-throated debate about what ecology might mean. And the conclusion that Am and Joe and I came, and I will make it brief here, is that, in fact, that if we are a, going to even begin to approach thinking about ecology from a constructive and an affirmative point of view, we have to both start, continue, and end by thinking about decolonization. Because if ecology is to be anything, it is to be a conversation about land, about how we use land, about how we allocate land, and how we think about land. And that thus, in this part of the world in particular, and certainly in northern Alberta, we have to be able to think about that through lenses that are working beyond colonial extractive and exploitive ethics. And we came to the, at the very end of our book, a conclusion that it is the exploitation and the domination of humans by humans that gives permission to the domination of the other than human world by humans. And that those two things are bound up together. And that if we are ever going to be in, begin to unwind and unravel the extractive logics that are driving global warming, we have to begin to think those through decolonial lenses. That's an inadequate ending, but I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Thanks to our um, panel, it was very diverse, had a really wide range of, of, of topics and perspectives and themes that we addressed. Um, but uh, I'll free it up to the audience. We can try to address this question. If you want to address one of the panel members specifically, who wants to start? So, okay. You, and then Derek. Hello. Um, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. This is a kind of messy way of asking a question. This is a messy subject. 
um, as an engineer, we kind of learn to solve problems by drawing little boundaries around the problem and saying, what's going on inside here? But I think that kind of approach, not only on energy, but what we want to achieve is wrong. It's what we now perhaps call a siloed approach. I think that um, we need to be thinking much larger than the individual problems of energy. How can we resolve carbon footprints? How can we resolve this through the ecology? Um, and I think that um, one of the things that motivates me is well, okay, let me go back uh, 50, 60 years ago as a kid living in London, England. I really admired Canada. I thought this was just the most fantastic country to go to. I still think that way. At that time, Canada was seen uh, as a lead in the Peace Corps with the United Nations. Um, to me, I, I thought, you know, they had the right values to work their way through problems of the world, particularly at the UN. I think that's where we should be. We should be thinking in terms of hope. And I really appreciate your point about um, moralizing to others. It doesn't work in terms of um, where we want to go. How do, we, how do we arrive at a point of hope? Who is going to take a lead? I really actually think that Canada could take a lead albeit that we don't even have an energy policy in Canada, which is kind of shameful, really. But if Canada could get to the point of taking a, a leadership, and I'm going to use the word ethics, which I think was only used once amongst the panelists, maybe twice. We don't think about the ethics. We don't think about the common good of the world. We talk in terms of energy, output, carbon, and so on, so it's very technical. We, as a country, should be taking the lead on ethics. And it's surprising that not even someone from the law school even spoke about or used the word ethics. So I'm going to put that challenge back to the panel and ask them to address the more moral, how can we bring the world's religions together? I think the Pope has actually said something about climate change. I haven't heard that from the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Dalai Lama or anybody else. How are we ever going to solve the problem if we can't all agree on basic ethical values? And we should. And Canada should take the lead. I'll pass it back to you to t comment. Does anyone want to take that up? Uh, um, I can just uh, thank you so much. And I think that you raised something that maybe we all raised in this like how to move past just like moralizing beyond good and evil kind of conversation and my, my like quick response to your, your provocation is I think there is a, a big difference between morals and ethics and morals tend to rely on certain standardization that does pr you know assume that there is a benchmark or a something to which we can kind of look towards whereas ethics I think is inherently messy it's situational it's faculative it like it's generative it depends it changes in every instance and, and, and so I don't know if we can come to a consensus around an ethics and in fact I think we need to work towards dissensus but dissent like kind of a, a di Guattari writes about this like unified disunity right like it's good that we're different we need it would suck it I mean like that's the thing we I think there's too much focus on this idea of like we need to come together and all be the same that's not First of all, I don't think it's possible. Second of all, that's what makes us rich in the way that, that I hope we can think about richness, like d diversity and difference, right? And so it's a really, I don't have the answer, but I think that, like you're mentioning, this question of ethics becomes very important, but maybe even like challenging what we mean about a unified ethics and really thinking about what it would mean to disagree, but also be on the same side in a way, you know what I mean? I don't know if anyone else wants to. I so much better than what was in my brain, but I, I really feel that too, especially when we're talking about uh, global scale issues like climate change, because the, the global part is important. Like coming, thinking together is important, mm -hmm. but at the same time, global is made up of so many locals, mm -hmm. and that tension and how we move between those two, I think, is th that is the ch one of the big challenges that we're we're trying to figure that we are in the process of figuring it out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that maybe it, it's. 
what she said. <laughs> uh, first, thanks to everyone for your extremely thoughtful and also uh, heartfelt uh, reflections, which is a hard combination, but the, both the, all five of you were great at that. I have a question that I guess I'll direct mostly to Amanda and Kevin. And it's about the implications of some of the reflections that you ha both had uh, for how we think about the form of politics that might be adequate to our situation. Uh, because I think one of the ways in which we can think about our situation is that the form of politics that we have is not adequate to the situation. And I really mean the form, like not mm -hmm. just the content of the various ideologies, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. but the actual forms, how we organize, how we govern ourselves and make political decisions and enforce them and take collective action. So in, in, res in, in regard to engineering, for example, we might, typically we think of like engineering is like you said, it's in a little circle and then over here is politics and sometimes politics applies to engineering or, but it, it's clearly the, it seems to me the upshot of your, anal your argument of what you're doing in your class is that engineering is one of the forms that political judgment now actually takes. Mm -hmm. And to what extent are your students into that or aware of that or understanding of the implications that what they're actually doing when they think they're doing engineering is that they're doing politics? And then it, maybe in regard to, to Kevin's uh, excellent story, <laughs> you know, at the end you came to a kind of ra a fairly radical set of, of uh, you know, we think we, uh, these are the, the orientations we ought to have, but no, it actually has to be about a 20 hour work week and it has to be reparations and it has mm -hmm. to be, which implies, I think, a radically different form of politics than the one that we have now that might be able to kind of orient us in that direction. And so how would you see the form of politics that might enable, conduce to uh, the kind of measures that you, spoke about at the end of your remarks. Do you want to go first? Sure. These great, great question. <laughs> Very tricky question. Um, yeah, so like at the risk of sounding overly like techno-determinist or materialist, I, I do think that, that infrastructure is governance in, in mm -hmm. like you said, many important ways, right? And especially when we're talking about this kind of infrastructure because of its longevity, because of the way in which it becomes invisible, right? All the more powerful it is in, in how it governs our lives. Um, and I, I, think, um, I think increasingly in engineering education, um, students are, are becoming more aware of that, certainly, and it, it feels like a great um, responsibility, I think, <laughs> probably, right? Uh, not, sorry, that, that was a very, yes, I, I think many of the students, and we should all feel, feel great, you know, responsibility. Um, and a lot of that is part of the professional ethics. What I'm, I'm curious about or wondering about is can we actually open up that responsibility more broadly and make it feel more collective? So that in, in what ways can we all feel more collectively responsible than for the decisions about infrastructure? Um, and I think, like you said, that requires new forms of politics then, new forms of engineering design, <coughs> but embedded within uh, a, a, a broader kind of social sphere where as someone who's not an engineer, you don't feel disconnected from the infrastructure that you live, you know, you don't feel like it's not part of your uh, responsi personal responsibility either. So I don't know what that looks like, um, but in terms of supporting our students thinking through this, it's like we want them to both uh, uh, recognize the great power that's, that's in these design decisions, but also think about how to share that power more broadly then. I, I don't know if that quite gets, <laughs> but some thoughts. Uh, this question of form of politics is, is really important, um, but it's also outrageously difficult, right? Like as soon as we start to talk about we should have a different form of politics, well, how do we get to that form of politics without that form of politics? Um, so it's a challenge. But I, for my work, my thinking, uh, the way I address this is really uh, that we often talk about this problem on the scale that it's taking place, which is a global scale. Um, but we have somehow just sort of wandered away from that very old saying of like, think globally, act locally, right? Um, I don't believe personally in the power of our particular form of democracy, our particular form of corporate governance, et cetera, uh, to lead us into the future. I don't believe in any of that. But I do believe that uh, when people start to address what works for them on their scale, uh, 
we find pretty radical solutions really fast. Um, you know, people need food security, they need housing security, they need uh, more time, they're tired of uh, commuting, to use my, my story. Mm -hmm. um, and we start to find that the city, if viewed through that lens, through the lens of how people would actually like to be living, uh, re re is reorganized rapidly. Um, and certainly a lot of the, uh, the, as we sometimes call bullshit jobs, start to fall away. Nobody wants to be doing those jobs. Um, and instead we find that people want to spend time doing care work, they want to spend time doing uh, work that, that builds their community, they want to spend time that, you know, sort of builds their inner self as well as their sort of uh, outer community. So I think all the all the sort of form of that politics is already present, and I think all of the impetus, the motivation is already present as we're hearing you know, from every single person, um, and certainly in all of our constituencies, like that's all we feel and hear. It's like, we're ready for this. But we're maybe not ready for this if it's going to be given to us by uh, Exxon or um, you know, the particular liberal government or uh, you know, the first past the post system or whatever it is. Uh, so I would just say that the form of, of um, activity is really has to be generated and has to be generated through uh, a form of interaction like how do we how do we engage in our community let's start there uh, and to Matt's point you know how do we think about land how do we think about where we're we're sitting where we're living um, and how do we interact with that differently and then you go next so um, so this is for, for anybody that wants to answer, perhaps those who haven't yet had a chance to speak on the panel. I feel I, I learned an enormous amount from your presentations. Um, I also feel like I'm, I'm learning something where there might be some kind of misfit. I guess I'm speaking back to Darren's question as well. So here's kind of my three point, three step process. I hear, I've heard from the five of you that there's something about speaking about environment that doesn't generate the kind of response or outcome that you want in various mm -hmm. kinds of ways. Um, then I also hear that there's these kinds of appeals to really radical change. Effectively, you're talking about um, a kind of political revolution. <coughs> I'm very, I don't buy the existing democracies. I'm not sure about global local either, actually, but um, it seems to me there's giant infrastructural issues that the panelists, at least, are compelled by. Very happy with a 20-hour work week as well, though I'm already damaged beyond belief because I'm an acad academic. <laughs> so, so environment's not getting the message. There's this need for some other kind of change. Why talk about the environment as the way to go there? Is there some other thing to do? Is, is the environment the place to do it? We're talking about literacy and action about tr energy transition. I feel that energy dropped out, and I thought one of the interesting things about energy as opposed to environment is that it kind of it kind of gets to a different issue, um, kind of a little bit contra what Matt said. There are Paul and maybe to the first speaker, there are countries that have energy transition policies that are quite radical. They'll say by um, Denmark by 2035 will not have um, fossil fuel fossil fuel powered cars. That's quite soon. It's not 12 years. I can't, maybe, it, yeah, it's not 12 years. <laughs> um, but it's still quite soon. And there's a policy of, that is done by the fe an, an actually existing federal government. Similar policies in some other countries. Um, Canada has no such policy. It's not even on the horizon. But perhaps talking about an energy policy as opposed to environmental one might connect those things that we're worried about. Environment, which is a bit too abstract perhaps. Radical change. Um, and... and um, and produce some kind of outcome. So I'm just curious how people would react to that. I guess I will say there's two things. Like why, would, why, just, why do we talk about the environment if what we're worried about is kind of a certain kind of social transition? Is it, there something else we can talk about? Does energy literacy do that kind of work? I can, I can take a stab at starting. Um, yeah, so we, I guess, don't talk about climate or energy. I mean, we talk about climate, but what we're offering people, I think, is a good way to live. Because uh, for so long, um, climate justice has been billed as sacrifice, either individual or systemic. Um, and I think that just has missed the mark, uh, whether that's fair or unfair. And so I think what we're saying to people now is, 
Uh, you're working really long hours. You feel overwhelmed. You feel anxious. Potentially, you feel lonely in this world. You're not sure that your life has meaning. Uh, there's a lot of existential angst out there. Many of the people that I know don't have a clear vision of a future of this planet. They see burning fires, they see superstorms, they see apocalypse. And we're kind of saying, this is a beautiful way to spend your time on the planet. Come with us. These, this is where good people are, and you'll connect, and there's deep empathy, uh, and you'll be working towards justice, and you'll be caring about the communities that you're in. Um, and even if we don't save the world or stop this, you will have, have spent your time well um, in how you're doing it. And that has been a really powerful message. And I think also offering people that they can bring their own skills to the movement um, or things that they want to learn. Um, if you're a secret poet or a musician or something else and saying, we want you, come and share that with us and, and share it with the world and, and learn how to get that better. Um, and every time I give a talk at a class uh, or somewhere else, uh, tons of people come up to me afterwards and say, how do, I, how do I come into this? So uh, we found that that message resonates. Hmm. Anybody else on this? Yeah, I, this is, I think about this all the time, and I think you made a, like some, it's really hard to, to kind of answer this, it's a really good question, because this is a really, there's three things happening here. There's this question of literacy, but a social, like I was like, what do we mean by social literacy? Like, um, and then how does knowing about something or being able to read or these kinds of things lead to action? Like what has to happen between those two steps? And then in this case, the action around energy transition. So I'm fairly new to the, the um, energy humanities circle. Thank you for welcoming me here today. Um, but I'm deeply invested in education, which I think is where we learn to be people in the world. We spend like a good, tw at least 12, many people, at least 12 years uh, learning a very specific mode of subjectivity, learning how to be a very specific subject in the world, but it's presented as neutral and kind of benign, right? Like educators are not political. It's inherently political, right? Everything, you know, small p politics. So. When I think about this question of like the good, whether it's the good life or like my claim, I'm actually, uh, although I, 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 um, I do think that there's a need to kind of identify how we live in this world, you know, and like make it through the day and find joy and pleasure. I also, I'm trying to take very serious the fact that the world as we know is changing. Like it's not, it's not the, the narrative we've been sold, you know, if through school, for instance, since day one. And so how do we actually start kind of navigating that so that we, we can find that kind of good life, that sweet life, while acknowledging that our action, you know, it's not just about me. And so like one of the, the, the things that I try and spend a lot of time with my students on, we don't talk about um, climate change directly or even energy or these kinds of things, but <coughs> questions of like what are these these assumptions that we all just kind of take for granted, the given, and one of them is that like I'm a bounded individual that I, you know, that there aren't thousands of critters living inside my stomach that allow me to eat, you know, that, that I rely on land and water and air. Like, I have to, the last few summers when we're unable to breathe the air in Edmonton, I'm just like, that's like, that's, that's, that's big, you know? Like, when you can't drink the water, breathe the air and farm the land, like, and so those big things, I, I'm so curious, like, what has to happen for something to happen? And I'm not confident that there's going to be some monumental break or that our political guardians or corporate guardians are going to take us there. And so it's like, I don't know if we can pinpoint it. I think there's issues we can mobilize around, like energy transition, because it provides, like, a concrete kind of thing to start with. But I think it's these deeper questions of, like, who we think we are, um, which is why I'm so invested in thinking through education, where we learn, I think, to be people in the world or in spite of it, you know? So I don't know, that's a... Can I also just add, uh, one of the challenges, I think, with, um, you make a great comment about, you know, why do we keep thinking about the environment and, and sort of what I hear us saying and, and what I hear myself saying is, uh, we actually already have a lot of environmental literacy in some way. We, we at least have the impending doom that we can organize around. Um, and we've seen, of course, many uh, political actors enter that, that doom with, with various solutions. So I think it has some sort of mobilizing factor, and that's why we, we come around it. But it, this issue of could energy um, and energy transition offer us a different way forward, I think it possibly can. Um, and in particular, if we want to use your example from Norway, 
you know, we, we could use our energy literacy to know that, you know, half of the GHG emissions of a, of a car are in its production, not in its actual use. Mm -hmm. And we could say, like, okay, so we've fixed the, the emitting part uh, of the car, but the car itself is still not a sustainable model mm -hmm. for this world. Mm -hmm. um, and we can use that energy literacy to say, like, this is a good start, but also cities have to be fundamentally different than they are. Mm -hmm. Um, and certainly the geography of our lives, uh, just to bring in my own background, Ge <laughs> geography of our lives, I have to say the word every time. Um, yeah, it has to, has to change. Um, can I ask you, I, I want to just throw, I want to ask a question, if you, don't, if, you, if you don't mind. Maybe ask a question to you guys and, and, and you guys too. Um, most people that I know will answer that question like, ah, people aren't going to change shit until things really start falling apart. Mm -hmm. The humans are incredible, like, you know, like, yeah, you can't breathe, but whatever, and you, whatever, like. You can go inside. Yeah, inside. whatever, the stuff that we adapt to, and the, like, people, like, people are unbelievably, like, flexible and malleable and creative in adapting to new circumstances. And I think it, I could be wrong on this, but it feels to me like it's a very commonly held belief that people won't change until they're forced to. Mm. It's a form of kind of catastrophism, and it's one that I resist wholeheartedly, mm -hmm. um, for all the obvious reasons, certainly because it's a, it's like a, a class-blinded kind of way to think about the world, right? Which is the poor people suffer catastrophically first, and wealthy people will surround themselves with, you know, mm -hmm. organic walls of organic food and personal security guards or whatever before anything it ever affects them. Mm -hmm. But I feel like most people's answer to that question will be, "Yeah, we'll develop it. We'll, we'll develop ways to act and talk about this when, when, when we're forced." Mm -hmm. I think most people would have a very simple kind of answer, like to that. <coughs> um, and, and I don't know. I don't, know if you, I don't know if you guys could yeah. speak to that maybe or think about it or if you guys have a comment <clears throat> on that or... I think for the, it's that literacy question again. It's, you know, I gave the example of bounded individualism, but like duration is another thing we learn in school, which is a fancy way of saying how time passes, you know, like, and that it passes in blocks. And this is science, this is math, this is, you know, and you only get 45 minutes for lunch and two minutes in the back. Like, we, we learn about things even like time and we, our, our ability to maybe think 12 years ahead or that you know, is also kind of implicated there. So I don't really have an answer, but I think that's why I'm so fascinated in these like questions of like habituation. Like how did we, how did we, how do we habituate to these like, these things and then using the power of maybe like speculation or fiction to argue that there's other things we could habituate to, right? Like not that habits are inherently bad, but how do we, how do we, yeah, like develop these other like li like modes of thinking, which is really it's. I don't think it's just action. I think that there's a lot that happens like at the level of like ideation, right, and fabulation. Um. I, that really just made me think about you know sometimes when we talk about adaptation, it, it really does feel very incremental and reactive, in, right? In the sense that it's like you're up until the point you're forced to change, and then you have to do something that that immediately you know deals with what's happening. And in, maybe instead of yeah talking about adaptation, we talk about imagination because then it's 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 a much more active like a, with agency thinking about change rather than just being forced when it finally you know we have to build a, like a seawall or something like that. I, you know my answer to that <laughs> is maybe too simple, um, <laughs> which is that you know like we often think about you know most of our emissions are coming from. Uh, companies or corporations, that's always how we phrase it, right? But that's actually just the activity we're doing at work. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, we're there populating all of industry doing these things. And so I think, you're right, like lots of people have the sort of catastrophic notion that something bad has to happen before we change, but I think that there's a possibility that something good could happen for people to change, which is, like, uh, if you uh, let people sort of choose what they manufacture, mm -hmm. for instance, like, what happens? Um, Maybe not, it's, again, a simple answer, like maybe it doesn't work out, maybe everyone's like, oh, I wanna keep doing this. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a conversation, uh, that sort of freedom to work in a way that makes sense to you. Uh, and certainly, you know, my experience with, uh, with people in Fort Murray with uh, Iron and Earth, right, the organization that's um, a nonprofit organization working with energy workers to be retrained into uh, renewable energy systems. You know, there are, of course, many, many people there who are very climate literate, who are very energy literate, like, uh, as you say with, with um, your personal story, like, they're not there because they hate the environment, like, they're not there be for that. So, you know, I think we could imagine something good happening in our lives rather than catastrophic, but maybe still something major has to happen uh, to give people the room to think differently and, and act differently. 
Um, I, it's interesting, I'm, so I organize with a lot of undergraduate students and they are ready to do everything. <laughs> like truly, but to, to see a 20 year old staying up until three in the morning working on climate justice when they could be anywhere mm -hmm. else in the world, I think has really kept me very grounded. And so I think when I hear your question, th those aren't the people I'm around and it's good to remember for literacy that um, researchers have started identifying these different minds on climate. Mm -hmm. uh, Yale has six. I'm sure there are more, but you know, people who don't believe in that climate is happening, people who don't believe it's caused by humans, people who do believe but don't think it's urgent, and thinking about how all of those need maybe different messages. But also, um, what we've been trying to find is that the people who really care, really think it's really urgent, they have a ton of social power. And, and indeed, that you don't need to convince so many people if you convince enough who, who care about it enough, and then they start talking to their own networks. And so one of the things I always kind of joke about it, but it's actually totally true, is that my mom likes to always ask me about my dating life because she really wants grandkids. And whenever she asks me that, I'm always like, well, how's your climate activism coming, <laughs> mom? Because that's when you'll get grandkids. <laughs> and there's so much power in that <laughs> statement um, because my mom really wants grandkids. <laughs> and I really would wait to see if someone like my mom, who lives in the suburbs, would kind of start leave it. And, and we always frame it around voting. Like voting is really this interesting individual step that has systemic things, right? So if everyone's like, what's one thing I can do? I'm always like, vote and get lots of other people to vote and know the climate justice implications of however they're doing at, at every level. And so I saw my mom campaigning for the first time ever <laughs> in the most recent election. <laughs> and can you imagine if tons of people were doing that um, and asking, saying, you know, you, we have so much power over our friends and family and not to, not to make them feel bad, but kind of to invite them into the vision of the world that we have. Um, so Matt's question was great and the panel addressed it and I know some of you wanted to respond to it, hold that because we do have a queue going here and questions and I want to make sure we catch up to the queue. So we have you and then we're coming to you, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I guess in answer to your question, I would just say like, there's an entire industry built around getting people to choose things, even if they're not forced to, and it's called advertising. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'm a designer and I'm doing my master's at Emily Carr University of Design, so it's, it's so interesting hearing all the discussions about um, the need for art and sort of how do we do in community engagement, how do we talk about this in a social way and sort of meet people where they're at and that so much of the work and research that's being done at an art and design institution right now. Um, and it just makes me think like this field feels so, there's such a need um, for interdisciplinary work and research and collaboration. Um, but I guess just sort of like, what does the reality of that look like, especially in terms of like academic institutions that all have their own uh, visions and sort of need for grants and, you know, how do we create this sort of collaborative space where we're able to, uh, you know, kind of erase the power imbalances that naturally occur between those institutions and then even on a broader level between like an academic institution and a community or uh, indigenous group or sort of an industry partner. I guess how do you guys see that space or if you have any stories of positive experiences or just stories around how do we create this collaborative space where everyone can sort of have like a, a voice at this table to create this vision. I, I just want to, if, if you could look, if I, because um, I, I think that your question is so important and I, and I think it's kind of bringing up some things that you were bringing up and it's, I don't, I don't, don't want to be, uh, hmm, how should I? I think there's a real disconnect in terms of demographics, I guess I could say, because I also work with a lot of youth and young people and their questions, their ca catastrophism is not the same, right? It's like, it's a different time and I, I struggle with this even with colleagues in the institution as someone in the beginning stages of my career who gets asked questions like about jobs and stuff like that, I'm like, wait, you, I'm, not, I'm not in this to get a job. Like, I don't think, I don't, ha like, that's not, a, like, it might happen, right? As a PhD student, like, maybe I'll be less employable in a lot of, <laughs> in a lot of ways, but I can always teach. Um, 
And so there's this, I, I, I think there's a real big disconnect between, you know, um, not just in age, but in terms of like, you know, what's happening out there in the world and especially the academy. Like, I don't know how many of us here spend a lot of our time inside the walls of the academy, but it's, it's a little out of touch. Uh, so I always, you know, make these jokes, like how do we seize the memes of production? <laughs> and it's not my joke, but like there's stuff going on, right? It's circulating and this is also how actual white supremacist fascists are also able to spread messages through you know something very similar to advertising that is actually taking hold at a scary pace right now and similar to what Matt's kind of suggesting this kind of failure of the broad left mm -hmm. uh, to be able to not just communicate but to really take serious like what people's lives are like right it's it's not uh, we can theorize about it and write beautiful words about it and you know, talk about capitalism and Fort McMurray and all of these things, uh, but it's it's a whole different ballgame. I think, uh, for me at least, in classrooms when I'm working with you know uh, a young person who's just come from Syria, uh, who's just trying to like grapple with like what they're supposed to like, where, why they have to sit in this way or do this, like, let alone energy transition or climate change. So. I think that, I don't know if that answers your question, there's, there's maybe lots of things at play in this question of literacy, uh, and especially as maybe academics, is like how do we, of course we're offering something different and then we need that kind of interdisciplinary kind of um, uh, collectivity, but it's, there's also maybe that disconnect that maybe requires that humility that you were bringing up, that we, you know, not just science or engineering, but like we as academics have to be like, okay, there's stuff I, I don't know, and in fact, I, I can't theorize everything or theorize, I'm talking to myself right now. <laughs> I can't intellectualize everything and make it sound beautiful, uh, or I can, but it, I don't know if it does you know, what I think it's doing. You know? So I think it requires a lot of kind of taking a step back and, and questioning you know, the limits of our own uh, abilities as well. Yeah. Yes, hello, um, thank you for the uh, panel. Uh, I come from Montreal, I'm a professor in design in Montreal with design also, and um, um, I wanted to ask to the panel um, your views on the pra practical tool, uh, tools for energy literacy. Um, one of the challenge is to make visible what is invisible in the day-to-day uh, -day flow of life, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, energy consumption, uh, and so on. And there are practical experiments in design uh, to reinvent in a poetic way what is a meter, what is a, a meter consumption f with objects that tell, that narrate um, what energy they consume, what, uh, yeah. and there are many uh, very, very great things uh, in, in this uh, perspective. There are also um, uh, design of game plays uh, for example, on how to explain what is the life cycle of approach of products. So the, the ener energy consumption is through the entire world, from raw material depletion to the end of life, and uh, life cycle analysis, life cycle approach can uh, uh, capture this energy, and, but it's invisible. So how to, to, to tell them to, uh, to narrate it? And I, I just wanted to, to mention also in Quebec, uh, there is a phenomena which is a theater play, and the name is J'aime Hydro. Here it would it would be translated by I love BC Hydro, the mm. institution, and, uh, <laughs> and, it's a, and it's a great success. Um, it uh, it presents uh, the pro and cons on, uh, on uh, energy uh, in, in, in the society and uh, renewable energy, and it's, uh, it's int interesting to, to, to know and to follow up. Yeah. So, so about the practical tools mm -hmm. for energy literacy. Um, so I just finished grading an assignment in that class that I was talking about that was, you know, having the students kind of do an energy diary, do some consumption calculations, and it was it's so neat to read, you know, students and their, their reflections on this, because I think uh, 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 the life cycle implications, I think, is one of the things that a lot of students weren't thinking about. You know, they talked about things like, yeah, like, I assumed that my electronics and my appliances were going to be the biggest source of my consumption, but we've had so many regulations. They're actually all quite efficient now, actually. And they're, in reality, a lot of them, it's, you know, manufactured goods, the embodied energy in your diet. Um, and what was also interesting to me was them kind of piecing together what are the drivers, then, of... of energy footprint, right? And, you know, they're, yeah, they're like, oh, like, energy-intensive materials, or the lifetime, like, how long I use this this thing is huge. Like, you know, if I have this thing for 20 years, then it's, it's versus I buy a new shirt every couple of months. Um, and so, yeah, I, I wonder, I mean, I'm not a, like, I'm not a designer person. So I'm, I'm so curious, like, once we figure out what some of those 
uh, salient factors are, like how do, can we get people to think about them more when they are making consumer choices as well? So things like lifetime, like uh, material intensity, um, uh, even if a product has extended producer responsibility. Yeah, a lot of that's just so, our lives are so seamless. I mean, so, so many of our consumer transactions are so seamless. Um, can we actually make them uh, less easy and then maybe more thoughtful? I don't know. I think, this, I think this has been a challenge not just by energy experts and energy designers, right? We've tried to make uh, clear this sort of ethical, um, environmental uh, uh, community toll of various products, right? We've had uh, the fair trade movement and, and various other movements. Um, and I think sometimes there's a question of like, which invisible thing are we going to make visible? Mm -hmm. And so there's the energy aspect, there's the uh, amount that it sort of takes out of the world or puts into the world in emission standards. But there's also the question of uh, if it produces less emissions, but it comes from photovoltaic mining in Africa that is very harmful at the site or very harmful to the community or you know, there could be any number of, of issues there, like which thing are we prioritizing in our design to make visible? Mm -hmm. And it, to me, it starts to become like really what we're trying to make visible is that kind of all of our consumption comes from a network of human misery and a network of environmental destruction. Like that's how this works. Like that, that's how profit is made. Um, so I, I think it's really valuable to try to make those invisible things visible, but I think it's really valuable, more valuable maybe, to remind ourselves that like consumption is uh, an activity that is meant to make those things invisible. So we're, mm -hmm. we're fighting a really uphill battle. Um, anyway, so I, I, I'm obviously not a designer, and uh, my design that I'm suggesting would be ridiculous. It would be a very large placard on every uh, thing that we buy. So um, <laughs> it's not that useful. Uh, but I do think thinking through other invisible aspects of consumption is important. But where would we get the placards? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think we have time for two more questions. Um, so I think we'll go here. And um, your hand was up for a while, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. And so we'll go to number two. Oh. Sorry. Oh. I have more questions. You can talk um, I'll try to keep it short. So I'm, I'm an educator, and I'm a teacher myself. And I agree with everything that the panelists have said about, um, and especially the last piece about targeting different um, age groups differently, because I agree the youth and um, the students are very motivated and in a completely different mind space than the adults, and we, 30, 20 plus, are somewhere lost in between. Uh, we, are, we can be swayed either ways, and that's the most difficult sector to reach, because you can tell us anything and we can go uh, to whichever <laughs> site calls us. But I think what we've noticed, and we, our uh, group here in SIRS has recently reviewed a lot of local BC, but also global um, programs that have done social literacy and energy transitions. And what we've been finding is several different projects work and taking into art and you know the concept of shame and top down and bottom up. But what misses down is the scaling up. And so these projects have worked individually and it was funded one off by a foundation or by an individual mm -hmm. and it worked and then it just died its own death. Mm -hmm. And we, we as a I don't know, it's, again, it's a, it's a societal issue or just funding issue that we are unable to recognize those efforts that have worked and that we know will work in other places, but we've just not been able to scale up. So I think one of the ways that we can answer the question today is to find these things that have worked, reapply it in different similar demogra uh, demographics and just scaling up and have a sustainable funding or management program or some kind of support system um, where it could be scaled up. It was not a question, it was just a comment. Sorry. Good. Might have time for another question. It's just mm -hmm. a okay. Um, thanks for your uh, presentations, and my mind is full. I just wanted to, uh, well, I wanted to bring up youth as well and <clears throat> comment on the thousands of youth who are on strike around the world, mm -hmm. and that's growing daily. And so when people understand it's their lives, 
they act, and we're seeing that with kids right now, and it's very exciting. But I want to acknowledge another group of people who I haven't heard about here, except in the reference to coloniality. Um, right now in Canada, we have people whose bodies are on the line uh, making a huge declaration about energy mm -hmm. and life and land. And here's my question. If we were sitting in the north of British Columbia right now, what would you say to them? Thank you. To, to who? <laughs> to the indigenous people that are right now um, struggling to uh, around the pipeline and with teaching us, I think, around about life and land and um, living differently than um, you know the 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 modernity uh, um, that we've been we've come to accept. So there are people right now on on the line. Um, if if we had this conversation there right now. Would there be other things that we, that you would say to them? I think I'd more want to hear what they would have to say to us. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, I would reiterate, I, I think, uh, thank you. And um, this question of, of listening, but also, uh, you're exactly right. Some people are, are putting their bodies on the line uh, and their livelihoods are already in the line of, of uh, energy infrastructures. Um, so, you know, it's partly what would we say to those people who are putting their bodies in the line, but it's also what are, what are we saying to the uh, state, the colonial state, yeah. the uh, companies that are trying to put these pipelines through? Uh, what are we saying about, uh, you know, in this case, the heredit hereditary system versus the ban system? What are mm -hmm. we doing? about the colonial institutions that are you know, attacking uh, many people in our country uh, and those people in particular. So mm -hmm. uh, we have to, you know, what, what I say to them, I don't have much to say to them. I say thank you, but uh, I have a lot to say to uh, Tr Pierre Trudeau, or uh, to uh, Justin Trudeau, <laughs> to Pierre too. <laughs> he might not be listening. <laughs> I, I just, I'm so, both in both of those examples, and I tried to get at this in my, my talk, I think they're both really strong examples of this idea of refusal mm -hmm. and abolition. It's like, fuck no, like no, I, I, I say no. And I think that, again, I kind of wager or think about these things in terms of educational practices, but schools are where you learn to conform and say yes, and yes, how high, you know, like these kinds of things. And it becomes more, I'm generalizing, of course, I hope. That's, I'm being a bit hyperbolic, so. Um, but the, it's generally this based on this kind of, and there's also this like rhetoric of like, how do we optimize or how do we do more? What do we need to add? And I, and I think that this affirm, and, and this affirm, affirm, affirmative kind of gesture, which maybe negation can be affirmative in a different way. And I think that that's like, for me, something I'm struggling through right now to say no, whether it's like in the staff room. <laughs> be like, no, mm -mm. Uh, or to my employer, or to the state, or to elected, like we don't get taught that. That's a different kind of literacy. And if I'm just saying no, it's not as effective of us saying no. Because if one person is saying no and it's me, it's just like, oh, that's just Jesse over there saying no again. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like, how do we collectively refuse the options presented? And hopefully open up space for something else that, that is this, the, as you were talking about, Kevin, like that, is, is based in desire that that is like able to it comes to fruition because it's something that it meets us where we are where we are at and it provides for us in a way us being you know both that kind of local and hopefully global um, and so it's something I'm, I'm developing right now this kind of fabulated theory of a pedagogy of the negative because schools are you know very optimistic and the youth will don't worry everyone the youth will figure it out and the youth are like uh-uh like we are not do you like the, it's already figured out we know what to do it's the c word capitalism like corporate like there's so many we already know a lot of these things and you know but it's this question of like how do we say no um and take that seriously and people are doing it and putting their actual lives and bodies on the line and so to those people, I say thank you, but also like, wow, like, wow, like I, yeah, I'm like speechless, I think. I don't know what to say in those situations. Yeah, I, I, yeah that's a, a great summation. I think 
Um, so a few things. One is that um, for people, yeah, there are so many indigenous peoples across Canada putting their bodies in, on the line. And I try to remember that every day when I'm nervous. I, I take small mm -hmm. risks in yeah. the face of for climate justice. Nothing compared to that. But it's a daily meditation that I can risk my reputation or risk my institutional credibility or risk my social, like these smaller risks that I think we we really owe um, people taking such huge risks and, and showing so much courage. Yeah. Uh, so I really think of it that way. And then, so I'm a lawyer, I'm in law school. One of the things um, that we've been working on and that the Hub has been working on and um, one of the, uh, is the connection between climate justice and indigenous law mm -hmm. uh, and how there's a really beautiful and robust connection there. I, I just had one of my friends on my podcast, Lindsay Burroughs, who's an amazing indigenous legal scholar. Uh, and she talks about that in more depth and, and kind of shows how uh, Anishinaabek law might, um, might have some answers and all the other nations who are um, working on using their law to fight for climate justice. Yeah, maybe I'll just say one just tiny thing to, to your, I'm not exactly answering your question, but something like it, um, which is to say that I, I, don't, I don't have any faith in the state at all. Um, and we live in a time where we have the, we live in one of the most progressive jurisdictions in the world that people around the world, everywhere I go, people say, oh, you're so lucky to have somebody so handsome as Justin Trudeau, um, who I'm not going to quote directly, but says something like, there's not a country, you know, in his defense of the pipeline, so there's, there's not a country in the world that would find billions of dollars of oil on the ground and leave it there immediately suck all the air out of any possible kind of transformative conversation. That's one of the most progressive leaders in the industrialized world. Similarly, we have the good fortune to have a NDP government in place here whose first act was to uh, um, uh, green light the Site C Dam. Um, and John Horgan, I'm not going to quote him directly, but he said something like in his very first televised address, said, I'm not the first person to stand here and disappoint indigenous people, but I'm going to do it anyways. Or something, he doesn't quite say yeah. that. He said something like that. That's what he meant. Um, so I have my, my faith in the state is, is, is non-existent. I, would, I, I can't vote for AOC, so, but I don't know anybody plausible to vote for. Um, um, other, I, I think that, that in fact that, that when people ask me, and this happens all the time, is people say, well, well, what the fuck am I supposed to do then? Like, just recycle more aggressively? And I think, and I think that the, I think the, the only answer that I have towards that, to that, and the only answer I, that I've come to for myself at the moment um, is that if there's one possible thing that to do to, 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 to confront global warming, um, and not just global warming, but larger renditions of ecological collapse and species decline and biodiversity, uh, degradation is is to get into substantive and continual and and material support of indigenous land movements. Mm -hmm. um, that if we're going to at any kind of scale unsettle our predatory and our and our uh, exploitive <coughs> relationships towards the other than human world, I, I think that the the only place to start and the place to start is the most promising place and the place to that actually can scale at some kind of some kind of depth is to unsettle our relationships, our colonial relationships that are so embedded in us towards land. And, and, and in terms of an everyday conversation, the conversations that people I hang out with want to talk about are, is, is overwhelmingly around rent. Yeah. Um, and how do we unsettle then those kinds of relationships towards, towards land and to property and to ownership? And I cannot think of any better way than to substantively support indigenous land defenders. And I don't mean that in a hang in a, a dream catcher from your rearview mirror kind of way. I mean that actually monetarily, materially, and, and financially. There, there may be a call for a, a, a national strike yeah. uh, is brewing. So I mean, there are things that we may be called to do. Mm -hmm. um, that sure. we're not used to doing. Right. Yeah. And they've been called repeatedly. Like, for example, we think, of, we think of Canada as a sort of tolerant place, and yet every level of Canadian jurisdiction repeatedly refuses and buries UN censure at the fact of violations of indigenous sovereignty. Um, I, I have no faith in the Canadian state, but I have tremendous faith in, in land resistance movements. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a... a I think there's oh. one. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I really... <laughs> it's got it at the bottom, is it not? Is it on the bottom? I can just be loud. I don't want to do that. <laughs>
No, we need it for the recording, so careful. I won't be loud. I was really pleasantly surprised um, by this discussion. I thought I'd be a bit lost. Um, I work in social services. I work with homeless youth. Um, so I thought, uh, mostly I came here because uh, nobody where I work talks about energy. Uh, and I think um, uh, when I say I work with homeless youth, that means that uh, most of the youth, the majority of them, are Indigenous because most homeless youth and most homeless people in this country are Indigenous. Um, and it's a symptom of actually how our whole society is run on energy and where we get our energy from. Mm -hmm. um, that's the missing conversation I have at work. We talk about all sorts of stuff, but what I was really pleasantly surprised by is almost everything you speak about is what I do every day at work. Mm -hmm. I try to create a different positive vision in people's minds. Mm -hmm. I try to transform how they look at things in the future. I try to give them like some kind of a positive hope. The most interesting piece though is all the work I do every day and I've done youth work for over 30 years on uh, substance use. And uh, the reactions, this is probably <coughs> isn't news to people in this room, but the reactions to people when you look at them and you say, you have to stop using opiates is almost identical to the face and the look and the conversation you get when you look at someone and say, you have to stop using fossil fuels. It's identical. When you're polite, you say you're, they're substance abusers. When you're not polite, you call them junkies. And I think the strategies of actually trying to transform behavior around addictive behavior or problematic behavior that's problematic for the greater community is just so similar. I was just shocked at how the conversation was actually about stuff that I do every day just to try to get people to get stabilized and to get back on their feet and to become productive. One of the most striking things that I'm going to take away from this is one of the things we do um, by default, and I think it's just because it's something we're trying to do to actually get people to get engaged, because the folks I work with, they want in. Mm -hmm. They're already outside of the society. They're disenfranchised. So they want the lifestyle that actually creates all the damage. Mm -hmm. And it's a narrative we support. So that's something I may take back to where I, I am and saying like, you know, maybe we shouldn't push this so much, right? Maybe we really should like try to, you know, speak to like, there's alternatives. There's mm -hmm. different things to do. So anyway, I just want to make that comment, so. It's a great place. Thank Perfect you. place to end. Mm -hmm. And if uh, anyone, everyone would join me in giving the panel with more and more. Uh, <laughs> Thanks again for everyone attending and being so interactive and having lots of questions. Apologies if we couldn't get to all the questions, but um, maybe some will stick around if you want to catch, catch any of the panel before they go. Thank you.